She had some club crackers. Oh, that's why she's so attentive. Yeah. She's in there. <laughs> Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Uh, <laughs> My sister's at it again, but I'll get to her later. Let's look at what's going on in the world. Cases are down worldwide, actually about down 27%, and it looks like that little plateau is gonna stay down, so that's good. If you look in our hemisphere, the USA and Chile and Uruguay are really the ones that have increasing numbers of cases. So while we're going up, Europe is coming down. You can see, if you look at April 15th versus June 6th, Europe's really come down quite a bit. Very happy for everybody who wants to travel to Europe. They'll probably keep us out again, but not, you know, not right away. In the U.S., cases are going up, but it looks like it's plateauing. Uh, but it's not the same everywhere in the U.S. And because it's still spotty, my guess is it will continue to spread throughout the country uh, through most of the summer. And you can see, uh, we, as I mentioned before, we were really hot in January. Things cooled off. I mean, March was really great. Uh, numbers were falling. And in the Northeast, some parts of the Midwest and, and the West Coast, the numbers are up again. And if you look at the CDC wastewater surveillance, as I mentioned before, it's still going up in Illinois, Wisconsin, parts of uh, North Carolina, uh, parts of Texas, and the San Francisco area, but it's falling in the New York area. So, but the net net is that we're up in the United States. If you look at our, uh, our uh, Houston surveillance, wastewater surveillance, we were doing great in February, all green arrows because it meant the viral burden was falling for the community. If you look at now, it's going up almost everywhere. Inside the loop, last week I mentioned uh, we were the only ones down, but inside the loop now of Houston, there's about two or three sites that are up, and it's now 381% of what it was in July 6, 2020. So our viral load is going up in our community, and not surprisingly, uh, we're moving from a low-risk community to moderate, and we may make it to a high risk again soon. Uh, if you look at the most recent uh, CDC data, we're at about 277 cases per 100,000 in Harris County. That's, a, you know, a low risk is below 200. We're at 277, so we're high, but it's going up. Our hospitalizations are 9 per 100,000. It's supposed uh, the, the break between low and moderate risk is 10. So that's also going up. So we're actually at a medium risk community now, and we're trending to high risk. Uh, the problem with that is if we hit high risk, uh, we're gonna have to have our, mas uh, our masks on. Uh, apparently there are two things you always carry in your pocket, a mask and, you know, just in case Lily messes up. That, that wasn't really supposed to be there. Anyway, Dimmick County's doing better than we are. They're at under 200 cases per 100,000. They're 178 per 100,000. So they're still low risk. But everybody in the Texas area is sort of trending up. Now, here's a really fascinating thing we were talking about last week. It looked like uh, the B1 variant of Omicron was coming back. That was that purple thing. But it actually didn't do it. It just disappeared. But what is coming out is B4 and B5. Remember, we talked about that about a month ago. Isolated in South Africa, now in about 20 or 30 different countries. B4 is 5% uh, and B5 is 7%. So it's coming up. And if you look at where it's, it, it's originated, these uh, sort of pie diagrams show the green is B4 and B5. And it's actually most in Texas and Seattle. So I don't know if it was introduced here because of, you know, we are an international city. And Seattle obviously uh, gets exposure from the uh, Far East. So. It looks like that's where it might have come in, through more, mostly through Texas and, and in uh, West Bend, uh, Seattle. Really interesting study out of Minnesota looking at wastewater. And this, this tells a lot of the story of what we've been seeing with these waves. This is wastewater, and they've, they've looked at it over uh, from the early of 2021 to now. And each of the colors is a little bit different. So this was, the alpha wave is gold, the blue as Delta, and then you can see the BA1 Omicron, BA2, and BA212. And what's interesting is that the, the, they've come in these waves. So you can see Alpha was about six months, Delta was about seven months, the two Omicron waves are five months and three months. And so we're not getting through a whole year. You know, we talked about getting into an annual vaccine. The virus is changing less than a half a year at a time. And so this is really important because for a strategy uh, for fighting this in terms of vaccination, we're going to have to have a version two of the vaccine. Version one, 
we just keep chasing these uh, every few months, and you know everyone will always be <laughs> will always be getting another vaccination. So there's an interesting New York, New York Times article showing that actually Omicron has been more difficult for the elderly, and it's very interesting to see why that is, uh, is the case. If you look at the pattern of deaths with COVID uh, this year, it was the same as 2020 before vaccines were introduced. And the reason for that was before vaccines were introduced, obviously the elderly were very, very high risk. But during the Delta surge, once the vaccines were available, but the over 65 and, uh, crowd got uh, vaccinated much more effectively than the younger folks. We did it on purpose, right? Vaccinate the elderly. And about 20% more vaccination occurred in the elderly crowd over 65 than for those in their 40s. And, and the timing was they got vaccinated right as Delta was uh, sort of surging. And so they were actually very well protected against the Delta surge, mostly vaccinated, recently vaccinated. but. The trouble is because their immunity wanes over time, and I just showed you these viruses are changing all the time, and we know the immunity wanes after about six, seven months, they were very susceptible to Omicron. Uh, and so what's happened in the Omicron wave is it really skewed the death rate towards 65 and older, much more than we anticipated. And sort of looking back on the data, it's really striking. If you look at uh, the age 65 and over in the red line, the peak for deaths in, from Omicron was much, much worse than for Delta, partly because they were better vaccinated and better protected then. But in addition to waning immunity, uh, the Omicron variant changed enough where it was also avoiding immunity uh, that was generated by the vaccines. If you look at the younger crowd, very little, exactly the opposite, a lower death rate uh, in Omicron versus Delta. So when we say Omicron's not as uh, virulent. It, well, you know, it's hard to, to say that because if you look in the 65 and older group, it's been very, very uh, serious. And who in that crowd of 65 and older was really susceptible? The unvaccinated, very high mortality. But even those vaccinated had a, a, a little bit of a, boot, a bump. Only uh, those who got vaccinated and with boosters. The trouble is not everybody over 65 has been following up with their booster shots. And so, if you look at the total population of people over the age of 65, these are the ones in dark green that had uh, their booster, were vaccinated and boosted. The ones in the light green vaccinated and the non-colored ones up there unvaccinated. So this whole population was susceptible to Omicron. And if you look at the difference in mortality between two and three shots during Delta wave, not much different. That was because they had intense immunity from being recently vaccinated. But look at this with Omicron, the difference between the dark green and light green bar, really dramatic. And that difference was, you know, the, uh, getting your booster shot. So those in 65 and old, older who didn't get boosted and got Omicron, they didn't do very well. So interesting demographic. We've all been talking about the seemingly increased mortality in the age group 65 and over. But that seems to be the explanation for it. So some news in the uh, vaccines in the news. Pfizer submitted their data to the FDA for uh, children between six months and five years. They finished their three-dose regimen, found it to be 80% effective. Uh, it also showed that, um, you remember, when they did the two-dose regimen, it wasn't any better. Uh, was not, it was not approved. When they did the third shot, there was no adverse effects and much better uh, effectiveness. Moderna also applied for a two-dose regimen. Wasn't all that great. It was 51% effective in preventing infections in children six months through one year only 37% effective for children between two and five. Both of those uh, submission packages will be reviewed uh, later this month. I'm not sure if the Moderna one will get approved. Certainly, I think the Pfizer one for sure and a three-dose regimen will be approved. My guess is Moderna is gonna have to do a booster as well. The other thing that came out this week is Moderna announced that they now have created a bivalent vaccine. In other words, uh, taking uh, the recent Omicron strain along with the original and making that a, a, a bivalent, in other words, having two different types of, in the same shot. They claim, although I haven't seen the data, that it's really much more effective. So we'll have to see. That's kind of what we need to get ahead of these waves that keep you know, coming. We need uh, at least a bivalent, maybe even a trivalent vaccine or one that's more universal. So my sister last week asked about monkeypox. She was so glad we reviewed the monkeypox data. So she said, I guess that's all. Well. Well, Shannon, <laughs> the bird flu is here again. Avian flu, it's really bad this year. Uh, so, you know, remember we talked about uh, flu in that it's, you know, it has the H and the N designations. 
the H stands for hemagglutinin and the N stands for neuraminidase. And th these are the two proteins that form little spikes on the su surface of the, of the virus. So. And, th and the thing about hemagglutinin, it's required to attach to it, enter the cell. Once it's in the cell, the neuraminidase is important for once the virus is assembled to escape the cell to be infectious. So both of those proteins are extremely important for the life cycle of the virus. There are 14 versions of the H protein and nine of the N which is, you add it up, you give you 144 different combinations, which is why it's such a difficult virus. So H5 is the fifth version of the hemagglutin and, and N1, the first version of the neuraminidase. So the H5N1 is commonly known as bird flu, highly infectious for, for birds. Uh, what's really unusual, that it, it's been a really bad season with tens of millions of uh, domestic uh, birds, uh, fowl being infected. What's unusual this year is it seems to be particularly bad in wild birds. And when it's bad in wild birds, the problem is <laughs> they're flying all over the place. So it's almost impossible to contain. So, so since October uh, of this past year, there have been 3,000 outbreaks in poultry uh, uh, facilities and more than 77 million birds have been culled. <laughs> it's a nice way of saying, you know. Uh, but they've, <laughs> they've been removed from the population. But there have been 400,000 non-poultry birds, so wild birds, uh, uh, that have also died. So this is a really uh, big concern to scientists uh, that it's spreading so easily to wild birds. And so, you know, the surveillance that we talk about all the time for, for coronavirus, we need to be doing surveillance for flu viruses, and, and particularly these avian uh, flu viruses. Now, most of the time they don't infect people. There's been one case, the CDC reported, of a person involved in culling of the birds. Uh, they got infected with H5N1. Right now, the CDC doesn't consider it really a risk, but you know, it's obviously a risk for people working in, with poultry, uh, in the poultry industry and uh, hunters who are dealing with wild birds. So uh, it is a concern. I'll keep you posted on that as well as we're, <laughs> I think we're gonna return to mock, uh, monkey viruses. So anyway, uh, big shout outs this week. First of all, I wanna do a giant shout out to Julie, our, our crew member. Uh, who has got a sewing machine and has been busy working on, on Lily's uh, wardrobe, particularly her new scarves. Also, a giant shout out to Todd Reinhardt, who's been named the Dean of the School of Health Professions. He's gonna begin serving that role July 1st here. That school has four different uh, areas, the Physician Assistance Program, the Doctor of Nursing Practice Program, Orthotics and Prosthetics, and Genetic Counseling. Also wanted to welcome the 77 SMART students who started on Monday. These are summer undergraduate uh, research training uh, students who come and sort of do biomedical research here. It's a very great program, uh, uh, very popular among students, particularly those who want to go into, uh, into health sciences. And then finally, I want a giant shout out to uh, Mrs. Agnes Perry, who's retired after serving as the principal of the Michael E. DeBakey High School. This school uh, is always in the top 100 schools in the United States. She's been at it for 11 years. She's uh, really provided tremendous uh, years, 42 years of dedicated service to the Houston Independent School District in the last 11 years at the Michael DeBakey High School. So I'm very excited for her. Congratulations, uh, Ms. Barry. And have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>